Oh, hello there. How's it going? So happy you could join us. I would like to take this moment to thank our sponsors for this podcast and every other podcast in the past and the future, and that's Alpha Fitness. They allow us to keep the lights on, basically. They provide the funds and the knowledge, in many cases, so that we can actually have a podcast. Because we're one and the same person. <clears throat> um, if you are interested in doing some personal training, uh, you should head up Alpha Fitness. Uh, that's where you'll get the very best service in terms of what you need, but also what you want. And what do I mean by that? Well, what you need to start off with is to learn to handle your body weight and to learn how to use a barbell correctly. And then you'll learn how to use dumbbells correctly and variations of these lifts. Um, to start off with, with, I would use a linear progression with you, which basically means that you take a lift and exercise like the squat and you add on, say, two kilos a week, every week for a period of time until you plateau. Um, and being a beginner, and a, even if you're not a beginner, but you've not been doing the squat properly, and trust me, there's a lot of guys that go to the gym, and a lot of girls that go to the gym that I see, and their squat and form is real bad, and they might even have quite decent legs, or they might even have quite a heavy squat, but they're shallow, not their personality, well maybe they are, but maybe I don't know them, I mean their squat's shallow, um, their back's all snapped up, their neck's all in the wrong position, a whole bunch of things. It's actually pretty technical, what Alpha Fitness has to do. Personal training someone isn't as easy as just telling someone, do these things. Now, a lot of trainers get that wrong. They think that it's about making someone tired. I'll just make them tired and they'll feel like they worked hard, but it's not about that. Yes, you need to be tired, you need to be sore sometimes, but not always sore. It's about progressions and going on the journey, just as life is. So, you need to make increments of gains over a period of time. Basically, if you've got yourself out of shape, that took some time to do. You need to spend some time getting back into shape. And that's just the way it is. So, start you off with a linear progression. And then from that, we would look to move you on to Westside Barbell, which is a very specialised training program. Westside Barbell, for a little bit of a uh, little bit of backstory, it was a gym and still is a gym in America, and it holds the holds the the most amount of people with the highest amount of records. So. I'm not even quite sure what the numbers are, but it's got the most powerlifters, the most NFL players, the most, you know, mixed martial artists, the most crossfitters, the most whatever. Whoever trains there has the highest numbers at their sport. And that's because they follow the specialized method. So that's, but you need to learn how to do a linear progression of squat, bench, deadlift, military press, rows, dips, pull ups, bodyweight stuff. You need to learn the basics first and basically build a good foundation before you start having variations in terms of safety squat bar, in terms of bands, in terms of chains, in, chain, in terms of a bamboo bar, in terms of uh, different different grips, different, you know, there's a whole bunch of things. And I think that I've went a little bit deep here, but basically I'm hoping that you get the Alpha Fitness know what they're talking about. And if you're looking for personal training, as I said, contact them or even if it's a training and nutrition plan that can be done maybe you don't live in the area which would be Perth uh, I've had lots of uh, what's the word lots of uh, success with people using distance training a lot of a lot of success actually um, and people even with uh, uh, diabetes 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 well, that's the scottish coming out in me diabetes and um uh, like, 
thyroid problem problems or uh, past injuries a whole host of things and if you listen to the podcast regularly you probably heard about the whole host of problems that i've had physically not the mental problems but you can kind of guess what those are um the physical problems that i've had um just this year i've had i've avoided having a, a fusion a fusion surgery with a couple of bones in my neck and i did that because i ate right i trained right and um, I didn't give up. And my MRI, my neurosurgeon looking at my MRI, and he'd not, he'd not seen me before, said that I should have came in basically hobbled and in serious pain. And I'm on known painkillers. And um, I did all these crazy jerking head movements because I was trying to illustrate to him some impacts that I might take. And he was, he was panicked and he was like, is that not sore? And I'm like, no. And that's because... I know what I'm doing in terms of rehabbing people. I know what I'm doing in terms of training hard but smart and holding back. I mean, there's there's a training weight and there's a competition weight. And if you're not competing, you don't need to go to level X. But most people do and it's you get tired and you get burned out and you get injured etc and then maybe after three months you can't be bothered doing it anymore and that's another pitfall it's consistency it's say twice a week for a whole year not four or five times a week for three months and then something comes up like holidays with the school or whatever you know and i just realized this uh, advert so to speak has went on too long so yeah i just want to thank our sponsors and if you want to contact them, you can contact them by typing Alpha Fitness and looking for the guy with the ponytail, the beard and the muscles on most social media. Or you can find them at The Buff Geek on most social media again, like the Facebook, like the Twitter, like the Instagram page. Or you can go straight to the website, which is the Buff Geek Podcast blog.wordpress.com. There's even a section there for Alpha Fitness, so check them out. And without further adieu, we're going to continue on with the podcast. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, it's Buff Geek here, and today I am joined by... Just me. It's just me. Yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, a little show called Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's going to be the season review for season two, and I did the season one review a long, long time ago, and... Long story short, uh, I got busier at nights with uh, personal training. Um, I also, uh, because of where I live, there's construction going on on the uh, theatre. So basically during the day from 7 in the morning, there's drilling or some sort of sound. Summer came and gone. And in this time, I've had buskers every day for the last four months outside the flat. So basically... Alpha Towers has been inundated with various noises and me working later, so it's kind of made things a little bit tough. And still putting out two podcasts a week, I've just not been able to do the ones that I would do myself. I managed to do all the previous uh, four months or so, five months up until May this year, which is 2017, um, because uh, it was I managed to squeeze them in during the day on a break in the morning if there's any personal trainers uh, listening out there you know that you get your breaks in the afternoon so that's when you do stuff um and then i've had a lot of things on weekends actually strangely enough well no wrestling because of my neck problem but you just heard about that i am fully recovered now and i'm ready to take some bumps and i'm ready to uh, crush some jobbers i'm only joking I'm not really. Anyway, so we're going to talk Buffy Season 2 now. It was quite a while ago that I watched Buffy Season 2, so I, I did keep on watching it. It was possibly two months ago that I finished it, and since then I started, I decided I wasn't going to do a podcast for it, I was just going to watch it for enjoyment, and I was just going to watch Season 3, and I was taking extensive notes, and they were kind of spoiling my uh, enjoyment of the show, so then I stopped taking them, and Long story short, was what I'm going to do is I'm going to work from my notes here that I took, which were rather extensive, plus some notes on Wikipedia and IMDb and my own memory brain, and hopefully I'll be able to put something together that's going to explain the season as a whole. Uh, this season is 
really about love and relationships and it's that young teen powerful love you know the one the one where you can't think straight and 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 everything seems so much more back then and i think actually i mean if you can't tell by my haircut and the way i dress you know i i think i'm still a teenager in a lot of ways hell i'm doing a nerdy podcast talking about buffy and i talk about star wars and look at pictures of action figures on instagram i mean yeah in some ways i'm like a 45 year old businessman who doesn't like loud loud noises outside and doesn't want to go to da club and doesn't like to hang out um with reprobates i never have and then in other ways i'm like 14 because me and my buddy lee just watched the last two hellraiser films uh hellraiser eight and nine and then some other random film called Eden Lake, which is fantastic with Michael Fassbender in it. And it's like a 2008 sort of horror film. Definitely watch it. Definitely watch it. Um, and we played the computer. We played um, we played Resident Evil and did some other stuff. You know, just f- stayed up to six in the morning doing that and then slept up till like 12 on the Sunday and uh, play computer games, watch a movie, like I said, like that's been our ritual for a long, long time. So yeah, that's the, the young young side of me. Um, and I don't know where I was going with that, but oh yeah, so that's why I identify really well. I've always identified really well with uh, teen angst um, and that, that kind of really uh, uh, emotional responses and being happy in one minute and then being really angry the next or really emotional or whatever. That's kind of a little bit me. So um, these teen, teen Ang shows have always really worked for me. And then, I mean, this is my ultimate show. Buffy is my favourite thing, my favourite TV show of all time. Um, and like I said, this one is all about love and it's about Buffy and an angel who becomes more of a main cast, or becomes part of the main cast in this season. And um, he was more kind of the man of mystery and popped in and out and had kind of a couple of awkward showings. And he really was more of a a character and I don't know if anyone notices this but when you have the main cast usually wears different outfits every every episode or most of the time but when you have um like a villain of a show for example they wear the same outfit always pretty much or or a, if, if they're a character but not a person they wear the same or very very similar outfits so the master wore one costume um so you can identify him straight away. Spike has one costume in this season. Drustilla kind of changes it a little bit because she's a female, but it's most it's very similar. But she gets because she's a girl, she kind of gets it changed up a little bit. Um, an angel in the first season wore the, always wore the white shirt or a white t-shirt or something, and now he's getting to wear. It looked kind of what's the word? It looked very like. Like it was from a gothic magazine, you know, like how to dress like a goth. You wear like a long coat and a white shirt and velvet trousers. And he gets a little bit more freedom in his outfit choices in season two. And it's a much better, um, especially when, spoiler by the way, spoiler, he turns into Angelus. And he suddenly when he becomes Angelus, I think his outfit's cooler. He's got the, the black leather trousers and the black silk shirt a lot of the time. Um... And usually a black coat on occasionally wears a a different coat, but mostly the same outfit. So you see him go from wearing a different outfit every week to wearing a really similar outfit almost all the time because he is now a character as opposed to a person. Um, so that's something, just a little something I've noticed in various shows and certainly in this one. Um, yeah, this one's all about love. So you've got Angel and Buffy getting together and it's getting really intense and um you have well maybe i should just talk about the episodes instead of talking about the uh the situations the 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 the, what's the word the relationships of the show because they'll give away some stuff and maybe you don't want to get there yet so i'm going to do it episode by episode i'm actually possibly going to cheat here and pause it a little bit check my notes because i said it was two or plus months ago and i've watched almost all the season three already and i've watched full metal alchemist in that time i took a break from buffy 
And for no reason, I just was talking about FMA and had to get right into that nice and deep. So I watched the whole thing, 60 episodes. So it's a little bit, a little bit far removed. So forgive me if uh, I take a second reading some notes. Okay, the first episode of the season is called When She Was Bad. And um, season two, and quite a lot of the Buffy seasons, well certainly even, and certainly in season three, I, I'm not sure about season four or five going ahead, but I'm going to presume it's going to be the case, but maybe not. They seem to have, season two starts off and feels like season one, and almost the characters change maybe three or four episodes in really change and the style changes and it seems like almost it's a little bit brighter a little bit more production in terms of budget i'm not sure but it feels very much like season one latter season one and at the start of season two and that and season three also felt the same way it felt like season two at the very start and there's a couple of changes like hairstyle changes that go on over the course of the show and i think that's really smart as opposed to quite often a new season of a TV show would feel completely different. Not completely different, but have this new gloss to it and everyone looked at this a little bit a little bit too different and they kind of do the, the change within the season as opposed to when the season's been off. Um, so this episode starts out, I just lost my notes here, when she was bad with Willow and Xander walking walking at night chatting and there's obviously so obviously some sort of chemistry there and it seems like they have always been friends as you well know and Willow gets some ice cream on her nose I believe and Xander takes it off maybe he licks it off I can't quite remember but it's done in a bit of a flirty way and you can tell they're about to kiss uh, when they're attacked by a vampire and out of nowhere our heroine who has been away for the entire summer with a new haircut and blonder Buffy appears, kicks the vampire's ass, but does, to me, seem a little intimidated by the vampire, a little bit worried. Um, she kicks the vampire's ass and they kind of talk about what they're gonna, if she's seen Giles yet and all this kind of stuff. And she's just like, no, not really. Why would I see him? And Buffy's just acting slightly off. Um, her father and, and, and Joyce also have a conversation. He says that she's not quite herself. And obviously, I mean... She died, so she's going to feel a little bit weird about things. and It's a real... You, you really feel like the pressure and the despair in this episode with Buffy. And it's quite... It's kind of heavy to start out with, you know? And as you progress through the episode, Buffy has a dream. And uh, I forgot about it, that it was a dream. And Giles grabs her and starts strangling her. I'm like, what the... F frick is going on here and she pulls off this mask and it's the master and which is nice to see the master again that gave me it popped me and she's having this dream that the master is trying to kill her which is probably the dream she'd be having all summer which is understandable you know I've, I've never died before I don't think I don't know if any of you have I am I've not been resurrected but I imagine if that happened you'd probably you know dream about it a little bit you'd be haunted by it and um, certainly if someone had killed you, I think you'd think about that quite a lot. So that manages to lead us into um, the villains of the series, or so we may think. We meet the Anointed One, who now speaks just in the voice of a child, which I thought was poor. Um, I liked how his voice was um, amplified in some way. And I, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it was deeper and darker and kind of like it, like it filled the room as opposed to just being his normal child voice it made more sense and now it's just the actor's voice and it doesn't sound very good but then we meet the anointed one and he's got a team of vampires and they've decided they're going to resurrect the master and we're told that the bones have been buried by the scooby gang at some consecrated ground so it makes it hard for the other vampires to get to it, but they do get to it, and they try to resurrect the master. And while they are while they are doing that, Buffy is attempting to basically be bitch of the year, it would seem. And um, you know, she goes to the bronze, and 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 Willow tries the ice cream trick again on Xander, and trick I say trick, but she she's looking for Xander's attention. And Xander just ignores her now that Buffy's back, and then Buffy's really off with Angel and dances with Xander in a very sexual way and she says something to him along the lines of 
did I ever thank you for saving my life? Sandra's kind of like, no, but, uh, you know, we're like, I'm liking this dancing and, you know, maybe, maybe Buffy's really finally into me. And then she just says to him, don't you wish I would? And uh, guys, maybe girls out there, when a girl says that shit to you, that's just, it's just harsh, man. It's like, yeah, you know I do. <laughs> so, is there a need to be a dick about it? I don't think so. Now, it's a shame for Xander because he never really gets, you know, he never really gets with Buffy. Um, some some of the lads listening to this have, and some of them haven't, and, you know, that's a story for a different time in terms of how that makes you feel, but for the people that have managed to get with that girl that was uh, so elusive, it's damn sweet, isn't it? Yes, 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 yes it is. So anyway, Buffy start, like, storms out, walks out there, just a total dick, and Cordelia, of all people, pulls her up on her supreme bitchery. And Buffy's like, well, are you worried I'm going to take your crown? And you're just thinking, why is there a need? There's no need to be a so. Why are you like this? Come on, jeez. Anyway, so Cordelia, I think... Someone else, I didn't put it in the notes because I was relying on my brain at the time. Um, I think Cordelia and maybe Giles? Some of the Scooby Gang members are kidnapped anyway as blood sacrifices for the Master, which is poetic of course, or convenient depending how you see it. And Buffy rescues them. And this kind of snaps her out of it, but she does kind of freak out a little bit when she sees the Master's bones and she she destroys them. She, she, oh, you know, it's Cordelia and Willow for sure. Because I remember Xander threatening Buffy that if something happened to Bu uh, to Willow, he'd kill Buffy. Which is kind of hilarious, but, you know, whatever. Um, and Xander got heavy beat up. And I think Giles is also there too. I'm just... Uh, uh, I'm not going to check it though. Um, so Buffy smashes these bones up and you're kind of like, alright, well, that'll be the master done now. And then she's kind of back to her old self, and the final scene is Buffy sitting with the um, with the uh, the original Scooby Gang, being Xander and Willow, in class with a special guest. And I, I mean, I could be wrong, but I paused, I checked out, I looked online, and it seems pretty confirmed. But I'm almost I'm ninety nine percent certain, unless someone can say that otherwise, that if you go back and watch this episode, you'll see that it's Spike is actually sitting in the classroom. Because when I saw the person, I thought, oh, is that Spike? And I was like, oh, right, maybe she has a dream here and Spike attacks her. I don't remember that happening. but And I actually recall finding this out previously that Spike was in the classroom, as in James Marsters. Because there's this slim kid with bleach blonde hair, and I don't know... Excuse me. <clears throat> I don't know how he got... How he was there. I mean, I don't think they would have hired him then being like, right, actually, you will be Spike. Seems kind of off, so do they just throw him in there for fun? I'm not sure. So, that's interesting. Um, I tweeted James Masters about it, he never never said anything. But that was uh, that, totally, that totally popped me that James Masters was was in the classroom being Spike. So it's kind of weird to see Spike in, well, you know, daylight. So it, it was odd, but you, you can't mistake that bleach blonde hair or those cheekbones, can you ladies? Mm, I don't think so. Anyway, so... Pretty cool episode uh, in terms of it's interesting that it would have been fun for Sarah Michelle Gellar to play and a lot of stuff going on. Buffy being a bitch is always kind of fun. Um, it's kind of like you're seeing season six and really season seven Buffy in the past. Um, Buffy season seven is not a fun person to be around, but we'll get to that. Episode I like the episode, by the way. I'm not going. I don't think I'm going to break down the episodes and give them a scoring. And I think I'm just realizing now I've taken maybe how long in this podcast to talk about this? Twenty minutes already, and we're only on episode one. So I think I want to try and speed this up. So episode two is some assembly required, and that's basically your uh, monster of the week episode. A few things happen in it, um, like Angel wears this horrible cream jacket, and occasionally they got Angel to wear something like like a I, I don't know what it was it was just like a a short kind of 
short with a collar blazer type thing and it was cream colored and it just looked stupid on him like he was one of Xander's jackets you know it just he's meant to be dark and mysterious and the whole thing and they did it a couple of times and it just looked bad it's like they were trying to dress him like a normal person quote unquote maybe they should have said something like oh do you, do you like the jacket I'm trying to dress more like like you guys you know and be like no um so that bit kind of is is pretty annoying and it's funny to see all these early scenes with Cordelia and him and the fact that she has this total thing for him especially from season one because obviously they fall in love later on which is very interesting um, but this episode is the monster of the week thing and some girls have been killed in a some some yeah some girls have been killed in a, a car accident and um, their body's been dug up and the culprits are two scientists uh, so to speak, two students who are in the science class of Willow, and their names are Chris and Eric, and they're using the pieces of these girls to make um, basically a Frankenstein's bride type character for Chris's brother Daryl, who died previously, and he was like a, a jock, and they brought him back to life. Um, Buffy has a real problems fighting this guy. This guy must be really strong, because he gave Buffy a really hard time. Um, in fact, he defeated her. Um, I've got here that Daryl beat Buffy, then faced her. I remember he beat Buffy, and then he ran into the fire. I believe a fire was started in amongst their fight. Um, a couple other noticeable things about this episode um, is that Giles does the intro from now on for season two, and ta- and says, you know, every generation there's a chosen one. She is the Slayer. Blah blah blah. And it's really good, and I really miss it in season three. And I think they should have kept that going all the way. It just worked really nicely. Made it. It made it more supernatural in a way. I've also written down in my notes here that Angel is jealous of Xander. I think that Xander kind of winds him up a little bit, basically about maybe Buffy's not at the end of him anymore. So it's, it's, there's quite a lot of filler episodes when you have a 22 episode season and so many series from back in the day, five plus years ago, had tough filler episodes because they want the, the networks wanted 20 odd episodes so they do half a year get a few weeks off at Christmas or whatever and so there is a few of these I've got to admit same as season one there's a few but they um they do move parts of the story forward you just kind of feel like if they could take out four or five of them it'd be so fucking tight and really like really move forward a little bit so these are one of the ones I would skip normally when I was watching it previously I'd, I'd watch it back i've only ever seen this one maybe twice maybe three times and i've probably watched the season a whole bunch of times so uh, i don't know if that means that i'm a good buffy fan or a bad buffy fan but i do tend to skip this one a little bit it's not terrible i just i want to get to the good stuff and this is kind of a bit better so um this one here oh apparently the u.s mil- u.s viewers in millions was 4.4 for episode one season two and four point four for episode two season two. Huh. We'll keep uh, keep telling you about this. Um, episode three is called School Hard, and this is the first episode um, where Spike and Drusilla appear. Now they drive in a Sunnydale sign, and Spike's like badass, home sweet home. But when I first saw Spike, I kind of thought <sighs> he was a bit lame compared to the Master. I mean, you've got the master who looks like this scary ass vampire, and then you've got James Masters, who's this. He's he's, he's a teenager himself, well, kind of looks like one. I mean, he's, I think he's like actually thirty odd in it. I just hope for me yet yeah, with the bleach blonde hair and he's quite skinny and whatever. And I just never thought. I at, at first in at first impressions, I thought he was a bit lame looking with his dodgy English accent, but I grew to love him and he becomes possibly the best thing about both the shows um so spike first appears with drusilla and that's quite interesting um and joyce starts to get a little bit tough on buffy which is kind of the first time that's really happened and the reason joyce is kind of tough on buffy in this episode is so that she can they can have Joyce go to parent-teacher night and it can be kind of worrisome. Now, Snyder has appeared in this season, maybe appeared in the last one, I can't remember, but um, Snyder reveals in this season, in this episode, that 
he knows about the vampire thing. He speaks to some of the police and, and they say, so what, what happened here with uh, with um, the attack on the school? I think I've missed out a bit. It was parent-teacher night and then basically Spike and Drizilla take a whole bunch of vampires and attack parent-teacher night, which Buffy is at, and so is her mother and other parents and teachers, of course, being parent-teacher night. So, um, after that attack has gone, has, has finished, and everyone survives, pretty much, Snyder says to one of the police officers, listen, what are we going to say? And the police officer's like, oh, just the, the usual, the PCP and everything. And Snyder's like, yep, yep, PCP, gang-related, the whole thing. And you're like, oh, so Snyder knows. Oh, so the police do know. That makes a whole bunch more sense as opposed to the police never being quite sure of what's going on. So that's pretty interesting. Um, Spike also tries to make nice with the Anointed One, and I feel like this happened later on, but Spike, um, after bending, bend the knee, after doing so to the Anointed One earlier on in the episode, and kind of the Anointed One gives him a whole bunch of flack for screwing up the the attack on the school, Spike throws him into uh, like a, a very convenient small cage and, you know, raises it up until... Uh, into the point where you can, into the point where the window has got some sunlight coming in and burns the anointed one. And he says, we're going to have a little less prayer, a little less chanting, I think it is, and a little more fun. <clears throat> and you're like, yes, so we've had the master who's seeped in rituals and the old ways and whatever. And we've got Spike who's all about the new and, you know, fuck off you wanker and all this type of stuff. And he, he likes... You know, he likes this world, as we find out later on. Um, also during this uh, attack on the school, Angel pretends to be evil and kind of says to Spike, well, you know, I just kind of give her this, uh, I'm, a, I'm a vampire with a soul deal and she lets me do whatever I want to do and I kind of feed on this person, that person. She, and he grabs Xander and Xander's really scared. And, uh, yeah. You know, you're kind of thinking, Angel's really good at being a villain. And Spike lets slip, you know, you are my sire, man, you are my Yoda. And you're like, oh, okay, what's what's a sire? At the time, when you first hear it, you don't, you don't know what that means. And uh, you couldn't Google it back in my day, so I had to wait for the show to explain it to you, really. And the whole Yoda thing, okay, so I kind of get that part, that part, but maybe you should have said you were my emp. Per Palpatine, but that doesn't sound as good, so I suppose he said the right thing. Something that I thought I noticed in the show is when Spike is stalking Buffy at the bronze, the way he looks at her, I think you can see the point where he falls in love with her. Now, Spike's killed two other slayers, and he's saying he's wanting to get Buffy so he can get a third slayer, but I think you can see the point, the point when he, he falls for her. I really do. James Masters is such a quality actor. It's just... Really good fun, but again, it still feels it's kind of bridging the gap between season one and two, and it's obviously a good, it's a good entry for Spike in a way, but it's a little bit. Mm, I kind of feel like more people would have died in the school, so that was kind of a little bit lame. And he turns some some troublemaker girl that Buffy was meant to, you know, work with on. Um, Setting up the, 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 the I'm losing my mind here. What am I thinking of? Setting up the the school. The, the God damn! This is what I get for doing these things late at night. Setting up the parent teacher night. There we go. That's the word I'm looking for. So yeah, she, she's kind of she's one of those characters that was in it once and really feels like she should only be in it once. And it's pretty bad and. Uh, just, not good. So there's some good bits in the episode, but again, it's a little. It's not as good as some of the stuff that comes up later. The next one is kind of your comedy episode, and it's a Xander comedy episode, kind of, and it's called Inca Mummy Girl, and it's sort of a Monster of the Week thing. And this is your Mummy episode. So basically, some some um, mummy uh, awakens from her slumber, and she's got to suck out the life force to stay young, stay visibly young, and just fortunately enough. There was a student exchange going on with Sunnydale and other schools. So Buffy was meant to get Empada, and that was some young Indian chap, I think. 
and uh, then she gets in Pada, who's apparently some very attractive woman, who Xander falls instantly for. And it's quite interesting because um, Impara says that, you know, she was taken when she was young and it was kind of her birthright and it was her calling and she didn't want it and blah, 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 and she was sacrificed. And, or that was the, sorry, Impara doesn't say that. Giles tells Buffy about this. And Impara and Buffy find out each other's secret at the same time, which is pretty cool. And Jonathan appears in this episode. Um, I think it's the first time that Jonathan appears um, with a name. And he, he kind of, what's the word? He dodges a bullet because Impada wants to take him and, and make him her cuddle monkey. Let's call him that. Not really, she just wants to suck the life force out of him. But he narrowly escapes that and then Xander offers himself up and, you know. It, it, it's a pretty pretty good episode. It's pretty funny as um, Monster of the Week stuff goes. This is quite a fun one. Um, Impat, Impata? Sorry, Ampata. I think I've been saying her no, name wrong. I've always thought they said it was Impada, but it's written here Ampata, so I, I don't know. So she basically says she's going to take Willow's life and she thinks that Xander will allow it because Xander loves her and they'll be together but Xander loves Willow more and doesn't allow for that to happen which is cool and you know I'm Pada. she gets offed and then we get to another episode which is definitely Monster of the Week stuff called Reptile Boy um, Buffy gets an argument with Angel and then she lies to Giles about going to a frat party with Cordelia because some cute boy likes her, but you can't, like, Cordy can't go unless she brings her friend and all that kind of stuff. And the guys drug them, and it turns out that this frat party is full of very affluent uh, teens who all worship some snake demon, who uh, who their parents have worshipped, and presumably their parents before that, and they all, their parents all own massive companies. It seems that they've been offering sacrifices for years so that they can be blessed with good luck I suppose or money or power or influence or something like that um, so it's quite interesting because obviously you're, you're you're dealing with a lot of issues already in the last several episodes that school kids deal with, you know parent teacher night really sucks and then you've got the, the, the time when you go to the house party and it's pretty weird or like the girls go there and the guys are you know, a bit rapey and stuff, and I think it's so clever the way that Joss Whedon manages to, and, and not only him, the rest of the team, but the way he manages to blend this um, school life with different aspects of the occult and monsters and such, and it, it kind of, I think it really works. It really works very well when they're at school, and there's so many... I don't want to say similes because that's not the right word. Analogies? Mm, comparisons? I can't think of the words right now. And it happens all throughout Buffy that you have something happening and then you have some monster that uh, is the, the visual representation of this problem. And in this situation, you've got these kids who are drugging the girls and hoping to kill them or do whatever with them. And that could happen in this in our world, but then it just so happens they have a snake demon they need to sacrifice to, so then it becomes kind of weird. So Giles, Angel and Willow, you know, kind of figure out that Buffy's maybe somewhere and Xander tries to get into the party, and that's pretty funny, but it is Monster of the Week stuff. I will say that Reptile Boy looked fantastic, and, like, practical effects for him were great, really, really well done, and that was kind of... There, there's some decent parts of the episode... But again, it's a Monster of the Week. And it's not to say Monster of the Week episodes are bad. I just I want to really get to some of the, the grit, you know. And that was watched by 4.8 million people. Pretty decent. The next one is a 5.9, which is the highest one I can see on the page so far. And it's called Halloween. And you can probably imagine what this episode is. Yes, it's the Halloween episode. So, um, 
The costume shop owner is a chap by the name of Ethan Rain, who it turns out is uh, an old quote-unquote friend of Giles. This still feels a little bit season two. Season one, sorry, it's not quite morphed into season two for me, I would say. Um, although I I know it's season two, um, so basically they everyone goes to the Ethan Rain costume shop and they get their costumes which are all cursed and it turns people into their costumes. So, um, Xander becomes a soldier and Willow wears a very sexy outfit, and like the sexy Halloween girl outfit, and then she puts a ghost, like a, a blanket over herself and she's a she's a ghost. So when the magic spell takes place she becomes a ghost that can walk through walls which was never actually apparent to me i've got to be a i'm kind of a little bit embarrassed by that but it was never apparent to me that she was a ghost um represented by her costume i just i don't know i never really thought about it. i knew she was a ghost or she could walk through walls but i never I never really made that connection that she was a ghost until i watched it this time around buffy dresses like a girl from ye olden times to impress angel and then she becomes a girl from the olden times, which is basically want some strong men come and save us, etc, etc. And other people are, if you dress like a cat, you become a cat, etc, etc. So, this is a really cool episode because you get to see Buffy acting distressed, Willow is walking around in obviously a more sexed up outfit the whole time, but, so that's a different side to her, and... Also, she can't be hurt, so she doesn't have to be afraid so much because she's a ghost. And Xander gets to be a manly man type. And Cordy, well, she got her outfit from somewhere else, so she's the same as always. And Giles is also just Giles. Um, and Halloween night is maybe a night where vampires dislike it because they think it's uh, too on the nose, maybe. But Spike decides that he's going to go out and have some fun because Spike doesn't care for conventional rules. Spike's my kind of guy. So he ends up getting all these kids who, if they've got a demon master, like a demon monster or whatever, so he gets these kids who are demons and monsters and whatever else, pirates, and chases after Buffy and her friends. Um, it's, it's a pretty fun episode. I've got to say, it is quite fun. I really like the Xander stuff in it. And there's some really good CGI for Ghost Willow. Um, it also hints that Giles used to be more than just a watcher. When he meets Ethan Rain, this is when he 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 beats the shit out of Ethan Rain, and he's Ethan is really scared of Giles, and it kind of makes you think, oh, what was Giles all about? And also in the episode, Cordy is still after Angel, big time. Yeah, and something else I noticed was that the the the, the kids at the school were asked by Snyder. Like the Scooby Gang was asked by Steiner to chaperone the younger kids and take them to take them out going trick or treating, and I I don't think that would happen now twenty years on. I don't think you'd be allowed to do that without having some sort of waiver or qualification or had done some sort of checklist or something. I can't remember what the word for it is. I'm sure you're saying it right now, but it's pretty. Pretty crazy how times has changed so much that, like for example, well, I'm too old now, but a sixteen-year-old couldn't take out some nine-year-old kid from the junior school connected to them, uh, going trick or treating in case they pedophiled them or the kid died. You know, it's kind of. I mean, it makes sense in a lot of ways, but also also seems kind of a little bit overkill. I don't know. Anyway, I don't have kids, so I don't really have to think about that too much. I suppose it matters more if you've got kids. We've got an episode coming up now. This was, oh, this was the 5.9 million viewers. I'm like, wow, maybe was that, is that because everyone was at home for Halloween? I don't know, but it was a pretty, pretty fun episode, but I don't know if it was a 5.9. Um, judging by a couple of numbers here. Oh, wow, that one's really high. So then we come on to Lie to Me, and... I need to check my notes a little bit more extensively right now. Give me a second. Now, this was a really nice episode. This is when this is this for me feels like season three started. I don't know if it became brighter, if the production budget went up. Something changed here. And I'm not sure what it was. I think they went to a new time slot at some point. Um 
first 30 episode airs on Monday, and then episode 14 went to Tuesdays. So no, it's not that, because we're not that far in yet, but something distinctly changes, and if you watch it, you'll notice it. <clears throat> and I feel like maybe going episode by episode is a little bit boring, but I suppose if you didn't want to go episode by episode, you probably wouldn't listen to a Buffy the Vampire Slayer review of season two, because, well, I could do it in five minutes, I suppose, but that would be very completist. So, when Buffy's out patrolling, she spies Angel talking to um, Drusilla, but we don't, she doesn't, we've never seen Drusilla, she's never seen Drusilla, Drusilla's always stayed at home, so all she sees is Buffy, is, is Angel speaking to a woman. And obviously Drusilla's quite attractive and dressed fancy-like and uh, older. So Buffy kind of gets a little bit weird, and then this chap from her old school called Billy Fordham, or Ford, appears, and he's all, like, kind of good-looking and kind of cool, and, you know, Buffy feels like she's being made a fool of by Angel, so she's very friendly with Ford, and also put Xander's nose out of joint a little bit, which I think there's even a scene where Xander and Angel are both kind of looking at each other like, what the fuck? I liked it better when it was me versus you. Who's this guy? Um, so the, the thing is with Ford is that he's actually the villain of the episode and he negotiates a deal with Spike so that the Buffy and the whole bunch of kids who worship vampires um, they are locked in some underground bunker type situation and Spike gets to kill them all and kill Buffy and you know, have a feast, but he's got to turn Ford into a vampire, because Ford is part of this group who worship vampires. And it turns out that Ford also tells Buffy that he knows that she's the Slayer, and she's kind of like, oh right, that's cool, because you're you're like a normal person who knows I'm the Slayer like Xander, but also you're a bit sexier and a bit cooler like Angel, so mm, I like you. And yeah, well, seems that Ford's a dick, but actually how much of a dick is he because it turns out he's got some sort of brain cancer and you're like oh that's kind of a good twist you know that he's not just being evil for evil's sake or because he wants to be a vampire or wants to live forever I mean that's fair enough and he's super into movies and shit but it's almost like a kid playing the villain his favourite character of villains he wants to play the villain doesn't really know what he's doing but he does know what he's doing because he's dying of cancer so he wants to, you know, put his, like, cancer to rest, so to speak, and become a vampire. And if he's got to kill Buffy to do it, well, then fine, because he's been ill. And <sighs> I'm sure that we have some listeners out there who've had cancer. I've not really had anyone that's been close in my family to have it, so I've not really experienced it that much. Um, it seems terrible. I know people who've had it, but it's, it's absolutely, it's awful. And I could, you could... When you hear that and you think, yeah, I could see why you would do this, you know? So you kind of get an empathy for him. And now it turns out that the plan goes wrong and then Spike and him get... Spike and the vampires and him get locked in this bunker and you assume Spike's just going to kill him because Ford says, well, I, I, I held up my end of the bargain. You're the one that let her away. Spike's like, well, you did hold up your end of the bargain. So you assume that Spike will just off him, but no, he does turn him, and Buffy kills him instantly. So, kind of shit for uh, old Ford there. Um, then we move on to an episode, that was a 5.0. Big drop, 0.9 million viewers from the Halloween episode, and the Halloween ep episode went up by almost, by 11 million viewers. No, 1.1 million viewers, oh I'm getting confused. 1.1 million viewers, so that's... An interesting and large drop from it. So it must have been something to do with just the fact it was a Halloween episode and Americans really go for that. I don't know if it really works out here, but apparently the Americans like it. Um, this is all US ratings, of course. Um, the next episode is called The Dark Age. And this one I have only seen a couple of times as well. I've kind of skipped it a little bit. Um, it's about the Mark of Agon, which is basically... It's, whole bunch of Ripper's friends, Ripper being Giles, get killed off over a period of time by this demon that they'd summered years and years ago. 
and you kind of see where Giles and Ethan Rain were acquainted. They were kind of, I don't know if you'd call them punks or anarchists, anarchists or whatever, but they were, yeah, they, you would probably, probably call them that, and they used to summon demons for fun and play with magic, and it seemed like a right old good time until one of their friends died, and then years later, each one of them was being picked off, and um, Aegon is after Giles and Ethan Rain. Um, so Ethan Ethan Rain ends up managing to put the the mark on on Buffy, um, and that 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 kind of means that Buffy's in danger of being attacked by Aegon for one, but two. Giles is kind of out of the loop on this one. He kind of he goes after Ethan Rain. I, I, I believe, if I remember correctly, he starts drinking and he doesn't turn up to school one day and everyone's kind of like, where's Giles? Why is Giles not being like super Giles guy? And in the episode, uh, Aegon manages to possess Jenny Calendar. Whoever they got to play Jenny Calendar as the Aegon character looked nothing like her, but it looked really scary. And at some point, you find out that Aegon jumps from host to host um, if that host is in danger. So Aegon would possess someone, one of Giles' old friends, they'd go and kill the next one, and then um, Aegon would jump into a different body and make them alive and then possess the next person after that. Which is kind of weird because you jump into a dead body. I wonder if I've got that right. But anyway... They, they they have Jenny possessed by Aegon and Angel um, and the rest of the team push Jenny into a point where she's, as Aegon, she's panicking and Aegon transfers bodies and jumps into Angel and that was done on purpose because Angel was reasonably sure that the demon that's inside him would crush Aegon and it did. It fought for Angel's soul and body and it's kind of like, no, this is my host, you'll, you'll get out. And the demon that controls Angel, the, the vampire within him, destroyed Aegon. And that's kind of how the episode goes. And then you're left with this situation where you're like, okay, Giles is kind of a wild card here. That's interesting. That means that kind of lets you buy into the fact that Giles is more dangerous and can, can fight against vampires. And he was trying to obviously write his ways in maybe 10 years of being at Watcher Academy and, you know, being 40 now and whatever has kind of calmed him down and trying to be British and kind of try to keep a lid on his old ways, which were very destructive. So this is very a very good episode in terms of showing you all about Ripper, but I have prepared to skip it. Um, I'm not quite sure why now, because I quite like it. I think it's because I wanted to get to one of these next ones, which is What's My Line and What's My Line Part 2. Loads of stuff happens in this. Kendra appears... Um, Angel starts doing his detective bit um, because Ken appears you kind of figure out that the Slayer line has been affected it is kind of weird that Giles didn't know that Kendra was you know being looked after by another watcher I'm surprised the watcher character didn't tell him um, I think he makes some joke about it. I'm sure there was a memo um, there is good banter between Kendra and Giles actually a really good chemistry almost like they were naturally attracted to each other, which is interesting. I wonder if something went on there with old Ripper. Um, yeah, a lot of stuff happens, and these are the ones that really start, you know, getting real. You see in this episode that Spike decides to use some uh, something a bit old school, and he calls for the Order of Taraka to attack Buffy. Um, this includes kind of like a big biker dude and a bug guy and uh, a weapons expert and also Kendra the vampire slayer who you who you think is the the third person and she attacked Buffy but it's actually it's actually the new vampire slayer because she was called when Buffy died at the end of season one and she mistakes Buffy for a vampire because she's so powerful and uh, also Buffy was kissing Angel and she knows the Angel's a vampire who she locks in a cage and you're like, oh shit, is Angel actually going to die here? Again, giving David, David Borner is way more to do. He's allowed to show off his, his weak side. Um, the reason Spike called all these, these um, called the Order of Taraka in, <laughs> all these guys in, the proper name, Order of Taraka, come on, John, um, 
is because he's looking for Drew's cure and he needs to capture Angel because the blood of her sire will basically empower her. So the whole thing is to capture Angel and to perform some sort of ritual so that Angel's blood can be used for Drusilla uh, to bring her back to full health because as I didn't mention earlier, Drusilla has been weak from an attack by a mob in Prague. Um, this goes down. Um, finally, the the Slayers attack Spike and his. Uh, uh, there's a, a red-haired police officer who's kind of like a weapons expert. Um, Kendra and Spike fight, and Buffy and the weapons officer fight, but. The weapons officer is too technical for Buffy and Spike's too unpredictable for Kendra, so they switch. So there's kind of like, so because Kendra and Buffy have already fought, we find out Buffy's the more industrious one and Kendra's the one that's going to practice more and is more technically sound but not inherently brilliant. So Spike kind of maybe can anticipate what would be the obvious move for someone to do in a fight, but maybe not the wild card aspect of Buffy, and vice versa. So they managed to do this little swap thing, which is really cool, and when the church, which they're trying to uh, resurrect Drusilla in, goes on fire, and Spike tries to take her out, Buffy swings this, I don't know what it is, it's this thing that uh, Benji used to save Jon Snow, in episode 6, season 7 of Game of Thrones, hits Sp uh, Spike on the head with something and knocks him into the the accordion and the whole thing comes crashing down on them. At the very end of the episode, uh, Drusilla bursts out of the, the ground, out of the rubble, sorry. Full, full vampire face, which we've never seen before, I don't think. R powerful as hell and just picks Spike up like he's nothing and is like, it's okay, pet we'll get her type thing, and you're like, whoa, yes, this is sweet. That was a 5 and a 5.4 million views, so it, that's good that it went up by 0.4 million, because that means there's interest and people talk to their friends about it, so the, episode, the, the, the part 2 really worked. We get on to episode 11 now, so about halfway there, and this podcast has run on quite a bit already, but I'm going to start to step it up a little bit. I might have droned on too early at the start. I am sorry for that. Next episode is kind of an interesting one. It's called Ted. And this is another one of those episodes where... Where is it? Where's my line? Oh, I've got some other notes here. Um, oh, there's a Slayer handbook. This is this is from... Uh, sorry, this is from what What's My Line. Um, Xander says at some point when Angel is being kidnapped, Angel's our friend, except I, I don't like him. You know, there's, there's loads of good Xander jokes in this one. Um, so many. I, I remember just laughing my ass off a lot in season two about some of the stuff Xander has. Uh, oh, and Danny Strong, who is a... Uh, Jonathan is a hostage again. He starts appearing way more in the season, which is pretty cool. Um, Ted, again, is one of those episodes that's... <laughs> It's a 6.1, by the way. This is the the highest viewed one yet, which is crazy. Um, it's one of those episodes where you're getting that real life situation where you've got the stepfather coming on, coming in, and is Buffy being weird with him because he's just, you know, he's trying to be too nice to her, and he's with her mother and all this kind of stuff, or is it because you know he's pretty weird and he's very abusive to Buffy, and he's a he's a dick basically. And when he backhands her, you're like, yeah, Buffy, you go and kick his ass. And he falls down the stairs and breaks his neck or whatever. You're like, fuck him. But also, you just killed someone. And this is going to pose a big problem. And it's just another situation where Buffy's been involved with something. And there's quite a few situations in this season where something happens. And it's like, oh, this happened. That happened. This, the Buffy was involved. Buffy Summers was involved. Buffy Summers. So the police are kind of building a case against her. So uh, you'd, you'd assume. So um, Buffy feels ter terrible about this. But she finds out that Ted is, well, he's, he's a robot. He might well be a robot. And uh, a serial killer robot at that, an android. So that's pretty cool. It's also cool that you've got... You had um, uh, the 
the robot from season one that Willow kind of fell for, and then you've got another robot storyline here with someone that looks very much like a human. It's fantastic. Um, hmm. What was that? Tough lesson to learn to watch her strength. Now I've got some weird notes here that they don't mean they don't even make sense. Anyway, it's a pretty cool episode in terms of it's really intense. You get it would have been good for Sarah Michelle Geller to do, it would have been good for Joyce, uh, Kristen Sutherland to do. Um uh, the actor in this episode playing Ted. I can't remember his bloody name right now. Um and it doesn't even have him listed. That's weird. I can't remember his name. I'm going to have to find it. Give me a second, folks. Yes, that's it. He's played by John Ritter. He was bloody fantastic in loads of stuff he did. He was great in the mid to late 90s, early 2000s. Quality actor. Um, sad that he passed away. Um, when did he pass away? I feel like it was maybe even 10 years ago now. Was it as long ago as that? Wow, 2003, even longer. Holy shit. Ah, oh, sad times. Sad times. Anyway, then we kind of get a, what I would call a Monster of the Week episode. Oh, kind of skipped a couple there. Do you know something? We've not even got to the point where Angel changes. Ooh, spoiler. So, bad eggs. Um, basically, the... the the Scooby Gang get these eggs they've got to take home, and it turns out that it's the eggs of a demon called the Bezor demon, and they're growing underneath the school. Uh, it's again like none of the even the Monster of the Week episodes um, are clearly Monster of the Week episodes. They do advance the story pretty well. Um, there's this cool bit at the start with one of the one of the cowboy vampires where he does this forward roll as hat comes off and he catches it. That was pretty sweet. Um, I think that there was maybe an egg joke that they missed when Giles asked them why they all have eggs. I, I, I feel like they cut out a joke there. Um, and oh, Buffy's egg disappeared during the library scene when they're sitting in the library. Buffy's egg just disappeared. It's one of these health class things and the eggs, you know, hatch and they take over everyone and they start digging up underneath the school where the bazaar is, to conveniently enough. And the cowboy vampire goes against his cowboy brother vampire and they, they come to attack Buffy. And one of the cowboys gets himself pulled in to the pit by the bazaar and his brother leaves. Um, there's some cool zombie kind of stuff going on here. It's a pretty... It's one of those silly, fun episodes, and uh, Joyce gets in, gets involved as well. She gets taken over by one of the eggs, but as it so happens, Buffy gets ultra grounded for her troubles. It says on Wikipedia, I remember her her mom not buying the gas leak story that Giles said happened. So, again, another thing's happened, and Joyce is kind of like getting a little bit worried there. I just realised it's really hard to do this many episodes, so I've got all the way up to episode 12, hour plus in, there's another 10 episodes to go, I think I'll have to call it there and do a part 2, because i got I got to eat and then go to bed, hopefully it won't take me that long to get the next part done, um, there's a distinct change in the season, coming up soon uh, I think it might even take me a week to get this one done or I might try and paste them together if I'm really clever so I might say all this and you might be like oh that's another episode um, that's weird so this might be a one hour one or maybe a two hour one I don't know how I'm going to do it I'm not decided yet um, but I'm hoping you guys are enjoying this um, I'd really like to know what you think I'd like to hear about your Thoughts of Buffy. Um, it's, like I said, it's my favourite show and I kind of feel bad that I didn't do these episodes, uh, do, do this sooner because things would have been a little bit fresher. But hopefully it's just a nice walk down memory lane for y'all 
just to think, oh yeah, I remember that bit and I noticed that, oh you missed out this, you know, so just let me know. Just let me know what you think and I'll be coming back with season two, part two. So this is like when you used to watch seasons and some of the young folks won't remember this. You used to watch a season and they'd take a break for Christmas. Um, I couldn't tell you when the break for Christmas would be on it. This episode, Bad Eggs, had a 6.5 million viewers. That's insane. And it really went up for a while. And then kind of... What? That's Is that the highest rated one? Bad Eggs is the highest rated one so far. And, I mean, the Gor- Gorch Brothers are fun. And... I don't know. The best episodes for the first half of the season are obviously What's My Line, Part 1 and 2. Um, Income Omega Girl I found really fun. Some Assembly Required was pretty cool because Buffy's been a total dick. Uh, and there's lots of nice bits in between a whole bunch of them, especially lots of good interactions between the the cast, you know, the, 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 main, the main Buffy team. Um, Oz becomes a main member of the of the team, and so does Cordelia. On something I totally missed out, so I think I was trying to push it so I could get to the end of the season, and I've just realised I'm never going to do that. So I'm going to talk real quick about the first half. Uh, in this time frame, Oz has kind of jumped in there at some point, and he's popped in here and there, and he's the guitarist in the band, and he's cool and he's awkward and Willow kind of likes him but she's still in Desander but over the course of the time he becomes more a member of the team, more so in the latter part and Cordelia and Xander been arguing a whole bunch and I think that's where some of the best jokes were, that intense, that intense kind of hatred but banter and when they get locked in Buffy's house together in what's my line possibly part one maybe it was part two they're arguing they're getting right in each other's faces when the bug man is coming for them and they kiss and so so dramatic and it's it just gives me really fond memories and i don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've just you've been in a room with a girl and it's just got super intense and then you're just suddenly making out, and you, and you, or even if you're not meant to, and you're like, oh, we shouldn't be doing this, but screw it, it's really fun. Um, really, really good stuff. Oh, to be young again. Um, also, Spike delivers so much goodness in this whole season. Where he shows this, how much love he has for Drusilla. And we're always told that vampires can't love him. I mean, the only reason Angel can love Buffy so much and so hard is because he... And I always remember that girl used to say, like, I love you so hard. And not hard like as an erection. But I always liked that. He loved, to love someone so hard. Like, that's how like, you really love them. Um, you just get a good connotation out of that. He does. He loves Buffy so hard, and I, I really like. I, I really like that. But um, the reason that can be done is because he has a soul, whereas Spike doesn't have a soul. He is meant to be a vampire, but he loves Drusilla more so, I think, than she loves him. She's just kind of weird. Um, but I don't know. You guys go back and watch that and see if you think that um, Spike and Drew, uh, Spike Spike falls for Buffy when he's 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 stalking her in the club. I think he does. Um, some other things about the first half of the season. Kendra is a little bit... I'm Kendra, the vampire slayer, with his dodgy accent. I wasn't sure what it was all about. and I didn't like Kendra to begin with, but watching it back this time around, I really quite liked her. Um, I also think that Giles has explored so well with Jenny Callender. Jenny Callender, I remember being crazy, crazy mad for her. Um, she is super hot. She's only like a couple years older, older than Cordelia at the time. And what's also scary is that maybe I said this in the first one, but Giles, I'm closer to Giles's age now than I am to Buffy's age. It's like it's more likely I'd be Buffy's freaking dad, and I'd be Giles's pal. Which is kind of cool, but I'm only going to be. 
Like I watched when I watched the show, I can't. You, you, I don't know if anyone else does this. I'm sure they do. They kind of put themselves into the char- a character of the show, or you know, you think about like how that, would, how you would deal with that situation. And I'm thinking, oh, I've already dealt with all the situations the kids had. I'm Giles now. Like I train kids who are 18, 16, 14, and one of them just completed. Shout out Duncan. One of them just completed his. Uh, is training with me because he's going off to the military and he, he wouldn't, long story short, he wouldn't have gone into the military unless he put on enough weight and had a good fitness level and we did both, so yeah, us. But it's kind of sad to see him go. And, and it's the same relationship, I suppose, that Giles would have, but obviously that's intenser because he's known them for longer and there's life and death and blah, 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 blah. Um, but it's sad to see Duncan go. Um But yeah, him and Jenny Calendar, I've got this really good, like, she's very sexual and trying to get Giles to loosen up a little bit. And he's obviously tightly wound for a reason, because he's actually a loose cannon and quite dangerous and mischievous. So that's very interesting to find out. There is a lot of good stuff that happens. Some of the episodes, like I said, are Monsters of the Week stuff, and on their own, they're a little bit just watching them as an episode on their own are they great maybe not but watching them as a body of work and part of the story yeah i mean yeah so good and i'm not saying that i wouldn't i won't go back and pick and choose like what's my line is is good both those but really from surprise onward is the next one that's when stuff changes. The main villains of the show change. Everything gets crazy. We've kind of done what I think. I think part of season two was the latter part of season one that Joss Whedon always kind of wanted to do. I feel like season one was eked out a little bit. And then what we'd like to do is we had a couple episodes less of that and then had some episodes dealing with what's happening in season two to start with. Maybe not introduce the new villain Spike so early and do something with the anointed one for a little bit longer period of time, maybe. Um, but something, I don't know if you guys can help me out here in, in voicing what I think is a distinct change in the show when you kind of hit the lie to me section. Is it the lie to me section? It happens after Halloween, isn't it? Yes, lie to me. That's it. That's the one that really becomes... It feels like season two. It feels different. Something's different and I can't tell what it is. Maybe is that because it's the first one that Joss directs and writes? No, he wrote and directed the first episode of this of this season. He doesn't write and direct until that one again. So maybe that's why something just, there's something special about it. And then he direct, writes and directs Innocence. And then... Ep- the final two episodes which are just immense and possibly the best like I kind of say part ones and twos are just one episode so maybe the best episode of the show the whole season the whole series sorry it's probably the best one of the season oh I don't know anyway yeah so hopefully you enjoyed the breakdown let me know what you think I'm going to do part two later on at some point I'm thinking I'll probably do it separately now because otherwise it'll be two two hour podcast be a one two hour podcast I think two one hour podcasts why am I doing it because I love Buffy and I want to talk about it and hopefully you folks want to hear about it and talk about it too it's also the 20th anniversary of Buffy the Vampire Slayer um, recently so Buffy Slays 20 hashtag all that kind of stuff just thought it was time to do it I've not watched it for a long period of time partly because I couldn't because it's a very emotional show for me and uh Yeah, some shit went down and I needed to I needed to wait till I was in the right mindset to be able to handle watching a show like Buffy. Pretty much. So that's it, I'm gonna leave you with that. Come back for season two. Just imagine this is like Christmas holidays. Okay. We're gonna go to season two, episode thirteen, surprise. This is when it really kicks off. And this is the this one is the biggest rating of the show 7.6 for this one this is the biggest one so far after bad eggs
So obviously people liked What's My Line. What's My Line 2? It went up again. Ted, more so bad eggs. I keep saying goodbye and not going. I'm going to go. Please follow us at the Buff Geek Pod, blah, 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 the Buff Geek Podcast blog dot wordpress dot com. If you need any personal training, nutrition plans, uh, training plans, or anything of the like, contact Alpha Fitness through that website. Um, you can find the whole gang there and follow them all. We are still going to be doing our podcast this week, which will be some movie news and something else we've not said. Probably talking about MCM Comic Con because we're going to that this weekend. And um, also, there's a new video on the YouTube channel which I've not pumped pumped yet <laughs> no that's something else pimped yet and it is uh, a video I spent a long time making uh, about three and a half maybe four hours for a three basically it's three minutes 40 seconds I probably spent three hours 40 minutes making the damn video and it's all about why Luke Skywalker disappeared and the Barash vow is going to be part of a Star Wars series I'm going to try and do I'm going to try and make a video every week Um with a little bit of knowledge about Star Wars in the, the run-up to The Last Jedi in December. Anyway, I think I've pimped everything enough. The podcast, the podcast, the Buff Geek podcast show on YouTube is there. I can't speak. It's late at night. I'm hungry. I'm really hungry for my next meal. And uh, and now my brain has actually kicked into gear. I'm starting to remember all the Buffy Season 2 stuff. Yes, can't wait. Hashtag The Buff Geek Podcast. You know, I think I screwed that up a little bit. So, hashtag the Buff Geek Podcast. <laughs>